Welcome to this short video on replicated event sourcing. This is a new feature in ACCA 2.6.9 and in this video we're going to discuss how we can use it to have active active event sourcing with cluster sharding. This video builds on top of existing videos showing how to use event source behaviors for event sourcing and ACCA cluster sharding. There are links to those videos below and if you haven't already watched them I suggest you do so before continuing with this video. Before going into replicated event sourcing, let's remind ourselves what ACCA cluster sharding is and what event sourcing is. When we build an event source system, we store the events that happen to the entities in our system rather than the current state. For example, we might have an event to indicate that a user is initially registered with our system and then they might change some of their details and rather than updating the state in a database, we'd store a new event to show that their details had changed and then we could have events to capture the interactions the user has had with, that, with our application, say what purchases they've made. When event sourcing is used in conjunction with ACCA cluster sharding, then you end up with one entity in memory at any given time. This is very powerful because it means that in a given entity, you can look at the current state and decide what events to persist, knowing that no other concurrent processing is happening for that entity. Cluster sharding will take care of both routing messages and starting the entities as and when they're needed. So that means that when a message comes into your system, be it over gRPC or HTTP or via a queue, then cluster sharding will route it to the appropriate entity. This might be a local entity or it could be a remote entity. It could be running on a different node. One of cluster sharding's primary benefits is that we can build stateful systems with things in memory without having to rely on a load balancer to route requests correctly. Cluster sharding also handles the failure cases. So if a node leaves the cluster or crashes, then the entities running on that node will be transparently started on other nodes inside the cluster. But because when using regular event source behaviors with cluster sharding, your business logic relies on only a single instance ever running, then cluster sharding needs to be very careful about doing this because that crash node might actually still be running on another side of a network partition. This is the trade-off that we make when using event source behaviors with cluster sharding. When those failure cases happen, so the crashes or the network partitions, it takes some time for those entities to be moved to guarantee that we don't have multiple instances running. Replicated event sourcing makes the opposite trade-off. We remove the single writer principle and we develop our business logic assuming that events can happen concurrently. The machinery of replicated event sourcing handles the replication between various replicas. If we store an event on one replica, it will be replicated to all other replicas. Now, of course, there could be a network partition between these replicas, so that, that replication could be delayed, and we need to handle concurrent events. For the same entity, we might have events happening at the same time. Most use cases of replicated event sourcing are trading availability, so we're getting more availability at the price of consistency. That consistency might just be eventual, as in we're just waiting for the events to be replicated across, but it also affects the types of data modeling that we can do. There is support for replicated event sourcing in cluster sharding. So rather than having one replica, we're gonna end up with multiple replicas. And there are different configurations for where those replicas will be placed. Now, as an application developer, when we receive a message, we choose which of those replicas we want to send the message to. Any events which are stored by any of those replicas will automatically be replicated to the other ones. So you don't need to send all messages to all replicas, but you might want to for availability. Now let's think of some use cases for replicated event sourcing. The first is inside a single data center or single region inside your cloud provider, but spreading replicas across the various racks or availability zones. This means in the case of a full rack failure or a full availability zone failure, you're guaranteed to still have replicas running elsewhere. Whereas if you just put replicas randomly throughout your cluster of nodes, then you don't guarantee that. This also means if there's a network partition between the various racks, 
we know we have a full copy of all of our entities in each rack or in each availability zone, meaning any communication between the entities will still be able to happen. Whenever that network partition fixes, then we'll have to reconcile and each of the various replicas will receive all of the, all the events they missed from the other racks. Another advantage of this configuration is for rolling redeployments. You can guarantee that if you do rolling redeploys one rack at a time, that you've always got a replica for every single entity in your system. Now let's think of some use cases which span data centers. So one reason to bring in multiple data centers is for locality with your customers. If you have customers in London, but also in the over in America or the south of Europe, you may want to have the processing for that user be local to their region. Normal sharding can work for this without replicated event sourcing. This could either be a, a multi-DC ACA cluster or separate ACA clusters per data center. However, if we were to have a full data center outage, it would be quite hard to suddenly service our Milan customers in the London data center or vice versa. This would be the same if we were using a more traditional technology stack using stateless applications. But the general process that we'd have to go to to fail over our customers from one data center to another is to sort out ingress. So how do we reroute the request to the new data center and then also ship the data across? These two data centers potentially could be using independent databases, in which case we'd somehow have to copy the data across. Or there could be some replication at the database layer with a database such as Apache Cassandra. But one thing you haven't done if you architected your application this way is designed your business log logic such that events from another data center or another replica could be delayed or missing for a time. When using replicated event sourcing in this scenario, failover is much simpler. Every time you persist an event in one data center, it will be automatically replicated at the application level over to the other data center. This means that if we were to fail over, the data would already be there and stored in the local database. Replicated event sourcing in ACA doesn't require anything special from the database. These two data centers could have completely independent databases. With that type of power at the application layer, it's worth considering going fully active-active. In an active-active architecture, requests can come into any node or any data center for any entity at any given time. This is usually a hard thing to architect. It might rely on cross-DC database transactions, which typically reduce availability and increase latency. Now that we've seen some of the scenarios that a replicated event sourcing might be useful, let's understand a bit more about how it works. In the normal case, Every time your application persists an event for an entity, it is automatically replicated across. This can happen in two ways. It can go over ACA cluster messaging, but also the other side can read directly from the other side's database. If no events are happening concurrently, then the logic, your business logic, will be the same as for any other event source behavior. We could have events happening in one data center, in the green one, and they just get replicated over. But what we need to design for is this scenario where two events happen concurrently. At this point, we need a data model like a CRDT, a conflict-free replicated data type, or we need some kind of reconciliation process which detects this and then does some compensating action like refunds a customer. To help with this, under the covers, using a version vector, Acker is keeping track of which events are concurrent. That's then exposed to you in your business logic so you can take the appropriate action. We also provide some common CRDT data types for you to build your data model with, such as counters, sets, and maps. The API that you use with the majority of your code when we're using replicated event sourcing is the same as you're used to with the event source behavior. The additional information is provided by another context, which you can pass into your event source behaviors. The, the replication context is where you get access to additional information. When an event is passed to your event handler in your event source behavior, you'll be told which replica produced that event. Is it the local one or has it been replicated from another replica? 
you'll also get told whether the event is concurrent. And if you need to execute any different logic, then this is where you check for that. To keep this video brief, I've only talked about the use cases and told you about the fact that the API you use is the same as the event source behavior. We'll be following up with another video on data modeling for replicated event sourcing.